Good evening, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining this webinar on COVID-19 and healthcare inequities impacting the Black community. This is a really special collaboration between a number of groups at Purdue, so I want to take a quick moment to mention and thank our co-sponsors, the Purdue Black Cultural Center, the Department of Public Health in the College of Health and Human Sciences, the Center for Health Equity and Innovation in the College of Pharmacy, and Purdue University Libraries and School of Information Studies. Tonight's incredibly salient topic merges two intersecting public health crises. One is the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic affecting all of us, and the other is the ever-present issue of systemic and structural racism that our Black, Indigenous, and people of color experience on a daily basis that has now been exacerbated by COVID-19 and the disproportionate burden of this disease impacting these communities. We're so grateful to have two incredible speakers tonight shedding light on these issues. Dr. Brian Williams and Dr. Sonak Pastakia, who I will introduce individually before their individual talks, and then we'll follow it up with a Q&A discussion. So I ask that the audience please remain muted and hold all your questions until the end. Uh, but do feel free to send those in via the chat, and we'll be monitoring those to include them in the discussion at the end. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Brian Williams is an Associate Professor of Trauma and Acute Care Surgery at the University of Chicago, serving Chicago's South Side. He graduated from the United States Air Force Academy with a degree in aeronautical engineering, and after six years on active duty, he followed a different call to serve, enrolling at the University of South Florida's College of Medicine. He did his general surgery residency at Harvard Medical School and a fellowship in trauma and surgical critical care at Emory University. Upon completion of his training, he served on the faculty at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas, uh, where he led the team that treated the victims of the July 2016 Dallas police sniper attack. And at a press conference a few days later, his heartfelt comments about the tragedy touched thousands and became a viral media event uh, and ended his life of comfortable anonymity. Uh, in addition to his role as an academic surgeon, Dr. Williams travels the country as a thought-provoking speaker, sharing his unique insight on leadership, gun violence, and racial justice. He's also an opinion writer featured in the Chicago Tribune and Dallas Morning News and hosts the podcast Race, Violence, and Medicine. Thank you so much for being here with us, Dr. Williams. Please take it away. Thank you for that warm introduction, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. And I want to thank Purdue and the Black Cultural Center for the opportunity to speak this evening. It's a very timely and really timeless topic. I have no disclosures. So I, I, I think back for probably two or three months ago, I was having a conversation with one of my colleagues. Uh, this was shortly after the George Floyd killing in Minneapolis, and there were protests occurring around the country, uh, but they're, they're still ongoing now to this day. Uh, but that was the beginning when it was really at a fever pitch from coast to coast and getting nonstop media coverage. And the discussion about the violent protests that were occurring that was leading to property damage in certain cities like Chicago became a topic of the discussion. And at this moment where I cringed when he said, uh, why don't they just move out their neighborhoods and go someplace nice and they would have to worry about this kind of thing. And I, I recognized that at that moment, there were two of us, two men, two doctors who deal with the end result of violence pretty frequently, one of us is black, one of us is white, looking at the exact same uh, images and stories, but came to wildly disparate conclusions about the cause, the root causes of what was, was happening, as well as the, the, actually the moral responsibility of the individuals that were uh, doing the protests. And from that, I realized that uh, you multiply that by the hundreds of millions of people in America right now trying to have this sort of discussion that there's a lot of work to be done in regards to understanding systemic racism and racial justice and what we can do to lead to some sort of unity uh, for the country. So I, I will use my experience in Chicago to illustrate uh, what I think are some very broad themes that have, 
has meaning no matter where you are in this country. If, if you're in an urban center or if you live in the mountains of, of West Virginia, there are things that, re, that relate to health equity that are quite universal. So let's just focus on uh, Chicago. Uh, as Dr. Rodriguez mentioned, I'm a trauma surgeon. Chicago gets a lot of attention for its uh, violence, particularly gun violence, which I, I personally find disheartening because there's so much more to this city than the gun violence. But that is what is uh, portrayed uh, in the media. That's what many people know that do not visit the city. That's when they think about Chicago, they think about this violence. But there is so much more. But as far as my day to day, that's why I'm here in Chicago is to do what I can to uh, to eradicate this sort of violence. But to do that, it, it requires more than just treating patients that they come to the hospital. It's understanding what's causing the violence. And if you look at this map here, this is the homicide heat map, which comes out in the Chicago Tribune. This one is a few, few months old. They put it out every week, but not much changes, okay? It looks pretty much the same week to week. You can see concentrations of red, which are just the gun homicides. Does it even include the non fatal injuries? These are just the homicides. Rewind really quick. Title slide, no disclosures. Back to the heat, the homicide heat map, weekly in the Chicago Tribune. As you can see that there are concentrated areas of gun violence in, on the west side of Chicago and on the south side of Chicago. And this has been this way for a long time. Uh, the question is, we, we know it's there. We can talk, we're going to talk about why that is and what we can do about that, and how they relate actually to what's happening now with COVID-19. Not only is it concentrated in certain areas, but these are racially segregated areas, primarily African-American uh, communities and victims. Now take a look at this map. All right, this is a map put out the, by the uh, Illinois Department of Public Health, or I'm sorry, Chicago Department of Public Health. And this shows the uh, COVID deaths from around that same time. In purple are your, your black Chicago uh, residents. And you, you can see that there's overlap between black COVID deaths as well as black gun violence deaths. Uh, why is that important? As far as gun homicides, 50% of gun homicides are black men, despite black men only making up 7% of the national population. COVID deaths right now, uh, about 30 to 40% in Chicago were black Americans, despite making up uh, less than 17% of the population. And nationwide, you still see, you see similar disparities where uh, black Americans make up 30% of the population, but anywhere from 30 to 45% of the deaths, depending on where you are in the country, are black Americans. And you see similar disparities occurring with uh, Hispanics and Asians and Native Americans as well. But even combined with all those other racial and ethnic minorities, black Americans are comprising, dying at a rate about two times the rest of the population. So uh, I say this not to exclude any other racial and ethnic minorities, but I'm talking about the group that is suffering the, the greatest and the group that I deal with on, uh, on a daily basis and also have a personal connection to. Now, if you lay these maps side by side, you can see that there is a connection. It's geographic, uh, the deaths from guns as well as COVID are overlap. And so the question is, why is that? One question posed to me was, well, why don't they just move somewhere else where they don't have to suffer from this violence or these deaths? Why don't they just get a better education or, or better jobs? If it were that easy, it would be done. But there is something we need to talk about when it comes to systemic racism and the structural uh, barriers that prevent that. And that becomes difficult to discuss because it's hard for some, for some people to grasp that concept. You can't point to someone and say, you, know, you are racist. You are preventing progress. These systems have been put in place long ago, and they're durable. And then when they were put in place, they were meant to exclude Blacks from society, and they've remained to this day, and they continue to exclude Blacks in uh, Black Americans in many, many ways. Now let's kind of like just kind of transition from that into what this means overall as far as health equity. There was a study that came out from New York University that talked about life expectancy gap across the nation, and Chicago 
had the distinction of being number one on that list. There's a, a, a gap of 30 years just going from five miles north to south. Your life expectancy dropped 30 years. If you're in D.C., met number two, New York City was, was number three. But nearly three decades of difference with just a few, with just a few miles uh, of living, uh, there's a lot to unpack there as to why that is and what we can do. Uh, specifically, what I deal with, uh, this is impacting our children as well. There's a study from the Erickson Inst Institute in Chicago that showed that 60% of young children live where over 90% where over 90 of the homicides occur. And the red there are the three neighborhoods that are served by the hospital where I work. So it's not just the interpersonal trauma, the deaths, the in injuries, but there is uh, the psychological trauma that occurs as well. It's estimated that for every gunshot victim, there are 20 people that are impacted somehow by that, whether by the loss of a loved one, by the psychological trauma of being exposed to that sort of violence. So let's talk again. We're talking about systems and, and structures. So this is going to take a, a broad understanding of what's going on as, as far as why this is happening, but also what we can do collectively to lead to change. And so this is this, this put, uh, push home this, this idea of this concept of structural violence, right? Interpersonal violence, easy to understand. I hit you, you hit me. Uh, there's also psychological violence, like inter intimate partner violence, that a lot of it's psychological, not necessarily physical. Uh, but then there's also what we talk about structural violence. So we have inequities, inequalities in employment, in education and food insecurity. There's this concept of cradle to prison. Uh, if you've heard of this uh, talk about the school to prison pipeline, which is uh, black and brown students are overly disciplined in school, leading to juvenile criminal records that follow them. They end up going to juvenile detention. They may end up in the adult prison system. We have now what's called cradle to prison. So you can look around the country, identify specific zip codes, and say, okay, when that particularly male baby is born, the day they are born, their chances of ending up in the criminal justice system far exceeds that of any other group. It's a cradle prison pipeline. So if you think about that, if you are a parent or, or a future parent, uh, what, 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 you know, have that knowledge that once, they're, once they are born, your child is born, that their life in the criminal justice system is almost guaranteed just by the fact that where, where, they, uh, where they live. And a lot of this dates back, goes back to redlining. Redlining was a federal government sanctioned uh, program that cordoned off and quarantined certain neighborhoods that would just be allowed to uh, have black residents. And as a result, you had economic divestment. Uh, you had employment divestment, infrastructure, schools, and that, that persists today. And if you look at the statistics by the U.S. Department of Justice, if you live below the federal poverty line, you are twice as likely to commit violent crimes. So that has nothing to do with race. It has to do with income and class. So blacks com black people commit violent crimes against black people at the same rate as white people commit violent crimes against white people when it's corrected for, uh, for poverty. So we need to start taking uh, this concept of race, this biological concept of race as uh, an exp explanation for moral failings, particularly now during COVID, out of the equation and look at what it is about our shared humanity and our shared experiences that are leading to these, these inequities. So we spent a lot of time talking about uh, the why and the problems. And I think we're kind of really getting to that point. Uh, there are the broad coalition of voices across the country now that are speaking out about systemic racism. You're not afraid to, to use that term in the media, in education, in, in the boardroom. So the next question is, okay, we're talking about it. We're kind of understanding about it. What do we do about it? What, what are the solutions? And of course, there's no use, easy solution and we'll talk about that more, I'm hope, I hope, in the, in the uh, Q&A. But I mean, we need to accept that we need a radical restructuring of, of how we view our, our society. Uh, health 
inequity is something that should not persist in America with all our, our resources. We have multiple different healthcare systems. Uh, wealth equals health. That, that should not be. Every child should have access to some degree of adequate education. No child should be hungry. There is so much that we can do to break down these barriers and deconstruct these systems so that every person has the opportunity to become the best versions of, of themselves. And nobody loses. It's not a zero sum game. Everybody wins in that scenario. So I'll take you back to this map. Just want you to keep this in mind, okay? A lot of this comes down to zip code, no matter where you are across this country. Much of this comes down to education. And we have put systems in place that racially segregate uh, much of America. Black Americans are, are suffering at a uh, great uh, extreme rate compared to these other racial and ethnic minorities. And when it comes to COVID-19, COVID has kind of peeled back the curtain about all the stuff that was already existing in plain sight around us, but it's forced us to reckon with that reality. So now the question is, is now incumbent upon us to not just talk about it, uh, not just recognize it, but, but now what we're going to do about it. And something like this that we're having tonight, this discussion, I think is a good start to get more warriors in the battle for social justice. And I look forward to uh, connecting with you. Here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. And with that, I'll pass it on to my co-panelists. I look forward to the robust discussion at the end. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez and the Black Cultural Center once again for the opportunity to speak tonight. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for your thought-provoking insights. And we have some interesting questions and comments coming in that we'll hold till the Q&A discussion session. Um, right now, I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Sonak Pastakia. He's a professor of pharmacy practice at the Purdue University Center for Health Equity and Innovation and the Indiana University Kenya Partnership. He typically spends 10 to 11 months per year in Kenya on site and through his past 12 years there has focused on implementing a wide variety of programs, um, including helping uh, set up a um, pharmacy distribution system, a community-based care program that now serves over 15,000 patients and uh, which provides antiretroviral medications to over 165,000 people living with HIV um, and over 500 health clinics of, of the Ministry of Health across Western Kenya, and a supply chain system for essential medications um, at over 76 sites. He also works in India and has recently moved to Indianapolis to address some of the inequities in health found here in Indiana, so we're lucky to have him back. Um, Dr. Pastakia, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's a humbling experience to be joined by so many people who are all unified around this cause. Um, and, and I just want to thank you for participating. Uh, the, the title here of what are we fighting for, I think Dr. Williams' presentation partially answered it, um, but I hope to give you even more insight for the things that we actually should be fighting for. Not and, and to go beyond the surface of clearly there's clear evidence that police brutality is one of the forefronts that everybody's focusing on but there's so much more below that that also needs to be addressed. And Dr. Williams did a great job of just describing some of those issues. So um, I'm hoping to provide additional insight onto why I think some of these other issues are important. So I, I also want to acknowledge and thank Purdue for holding a session with um, Ibram X. Kendi a couple weeks ago. And if you only have 20 to 30 minutes to learn more about this topic and the racial disparities, I would really encourage you to turn off my video and go and watch a YouTube video from Ibram. Uh, I think he does an amazingly effective job at discussing very complex issues in a way that, that um, can be easily digested and understood by a broad swath of the population and even going deeper to help others develop an even deeper understanding of it. Um, so if you, if you ever uh, get a chance to uh, listen to one of his videos, please um, do what you can to listen because I think he does an amazing job. And I also want to commend Purdue for bringing him to be a speaker several weeks ago. Uh, so for today, I want to piggyback on a lot of the things that Dr. Williams talked about. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit more about the social, so social consequences of inequity. I also want to talk about the social determinants of health 
and give you some of the data for why these are such big issues. And then I also want to deviate a little bit and pivot to cognitive dissonance, uh, because I think as we approach another election, and one of the most pivotal elections of, of my life at least, uh, I think it's important to understand some of the forces at play and how people are using them to sell um, their lies, sell, sell a lot of these things which are factually incorrect uh, and why they're doing it so that we can start to dispel some of these issues. So to start similar to what Dr. Williams mentioned about the life expectancies, I wanted to show two other cities that also have similar, um, similar trends that are very concerning. Uh, and so if you look at the life expectancy in New Orleans, what becomes very clear is that there are large disparities just based on where you're born. And so if you look at this, this map of New Orleans, you can see if you were born in this area near the French Quarter, um, I think you can see it down here, the purple one with 55 years, your life expectancy is 55. Now, if you were born just a couple of miles away near Lakeview, you have a life expectancy of 80 years. And, and, and similar to Dr. Williams, I, I think it's unimaginable that within America that we are willing to accept these disparities in our own country, um, in the same cities. Uh, and the reason why I think this is important for me is back you know, about 15, 20 years ago when I started my training as a healthcare provider, I, I started seeing the disparities in HIV outcomes. So the, epide the viral epidemic of my generation was HIV. And so back in those days, based on where you lived, if you lived in Africa, in, in regions that did not have good access to medications, what you saw was that there was about a 30 to 40 year lower life expectancy if you had HIV in, in Africa versus having it in, in places in America where drug access was there. And to me, that was unconscionable, that you could basically take away that much life just because of where you were born. And if you look at America now, we're basically taking a quarter of life away. So if you expect that the average life expectancy is 75 years and there's a 25 year difference in places like um, New Orleans, you're basically taking a quarter of their life expectancy away. And the same thing that drove me to um, try to tackle HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa is the same thing that's leading me to really be just appalled and shocked at the disparities that we see in, in the cities that we live in in America. And just to show you that our own backyards are not immune to this, what becomes very clear is Indianapolis has a similar trend. And so if you look at this map of life expectancy in Indianapolis, if you look at these uh, aqua shaded colors in, in Indianapolis, they basically have a life expectancy of 64.6 to 70.7 years. Now, if you look at these darker blue regions, the life expectancy, if you were born there, is 81 to 90.7. And once again, there's a, approximately anywhere between a 25 to, to 15 year difference in life expectancy based on where you're born, even in Indianapolis. And the reason why I think it's important to really focus on areas even within our own backyards is a lot of time these statistics are there, but we simply choose not to see them. Um, and I wanna make sure that everybody who's on this session or anybody I talk to gets to see these these disparities, which should be unacceptable. And the other reason is when, when we were in Kenya for the last 12 years, we had a lot of students who would come to Indianapolis who wanted to, uh, to come to Kenya, who wanted to address health disparities in Kenya without realizing that similar health disparities exist in their own backyards in Indiana. Uh, and so to me, I think it's important that we highlight these things and talk more about it so that we don't have um, people uh, casting a blind eye to these problems which to me should be unacceptable to all Americans, not African Americans, not Asian Americans, not Hispanic Americans, to all Americans, that we accept such large disparities in life expectancy simply dependent on where you're born. It should not be allowed. Um, and we should, as a society, get together and figure out ways to address that. So I wanted to very quickly, to make sure everybody's awake, shift to a, a polling question just to see where people are at on some of these issues. So I, I want you to, to tell me um, this. I hope you can all see this. Um, I want to get your views on which racial disparity you would like to, the winner of the upcoming presidential election to make their top priority. And so if you have the ability to vote on this, please do so.
I'll wait another 12 seconds. This is great. Thank you very much. Your responses almost feel like I'm talking to each one of you. So thank you for your responses. Great. So as you can see, I'm going to end the polling. And hopefully you can see the results. Um, you can see that the, the number one uh, disparity that people want to focus on are disparities in access to healthcare services. Um, and, and thankfully, I, I guess, um, nobody in the audience is suggesting that racial disparities aren't a big enough issue to try to address in the US. Um, and I, I want you to remember that response because I'll, I'll touch on that later as well. Um, and, and you can see some of these other ones, disparities in economic, economic opportunities is number two. Um, and you can see the criminal justice system is number three. Um, but thank you for your responses. This is very helpful to me. Great, so I'm hoping you guys can see my, my screen again now. Um, so I, I wanted to really touch upon why your responses to that question are very important right now in this day and age. Um, and, and the reason why is the study that was done in Wisconsin a couple of years ago, which to me is just fascinating. Um, when what they did was they basically wanted to find out what the contributors to health outcomes were uh, in this rural area in Wisconsin. And so they defined health outcomes as being 50% related to the length of life and 50% to the quality of life. And then they did a very comprehensive analysis of these communities to figure out what the drivers of these things were. So what they, they did also was they also realized that policies and programs lead to health factors, and those also contribute to health outcomes to just draw a framework for how they were defining this thing. But now, importantly, the thing that was one of the key findings from this study that I constantly try to remind myself is that they found that clinical care, meaning the, the clinical care you get from physicians, from pharmacists, from the healthcare system um, in a more traditional fashion, are only responsible for 20% of the health outcomes that people observe. And this is incredibly important because I know in my training when I was growing up, I remember thinking that as a healthcare provider, we had control over the health of patients, which clearly is an antiquated and silly notion, but that's almost kind of how we were trained, that what we do between the walls of a clinic or in the walls of a hospital are the things that really determine the health outcomes of people. And what this study really found was that that was only responsible for 20%. So if you as a healthcare provider adopt that approach and think that you control the health, that you should focus just on health in the clinic, what you're essentially saying is that you only want to assist the patient or the person you're serving with only 20% of the things that are modifiable in terms of their health. Uh, and you can see how if you take that approach, the, the changes and the improvements you can achieve are pretty limited. Um, and so this is one of the key messages that I hope everybody leaves with is the realization that health is not just what's done in a healthcare facility or in a clinic. It's so much more than that. And so now if you look at the next level that they found, that health behaviors were responsible for another 30%. And, and as we all know and imagine, all of these things are big drivers of health outcomes. Now, one of the big ones I really want to focus on is diet and exercise, especially during the time of coronavirus, where many of us can't have as active a lifestyle as we want, we're stuck inside a lot more. And what we're seeing more and more is that for people who can work at home, we're sitting at desks more often. And I, I'm not even going to talk about anybody else. I'm going to talk about me because I find that I'm sitting on the desk at my desk a lot, and it's harder and harder to, to get more physical activity. And I don't know if you can see my background, but even with a treadmill behind me, I can tell you honestly that I haven't sat, walked on it, ran on it in, in a couple of months. And I'm not saying that proudly. Um, that's just the reality of a lot of the things that we're facing right now. And if you can imagine that reality for people like me um, who, who are professors and have the ability to um, stay at home, imagine that reality for others. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to keep these things in mind. Next is, that, is physical environment. So they found that physical environment was responsible for 10% of health outcomes. Um, now, I'm sure many of you have seen the news and the very concerning news of, of climate change wreaking havoc, havoc on America. You know, we have wildfires in the, west, in the West Coast. We have two or three hurricanes that are soon to hit, hit landfall in America. And this 10% physical environment is going to continue to grow especially as we put our heads in the sand um, as it relates to climate change. So this 10% expect through our lifetimes, the lifetimes of our kids, that this will grow considerably in terms of determining health outcomes for the population. 
And lastly, the important one, 40% of these health outcomes are driven by social and economic factors. And I think if you remember anything from what Dr. Williams talked about, he talked about all these systemic issues that plague minority communities and especially um, black communities. And we have not done a good job of addressing them yet. And so it's no surprise that health outcomes continue to be um, disproportionately worse for certain ethnic minorities because we haven't addressed the thing that is responsible for 40% of the health outcomes we see. So this includes education, employment, income, family and social support, and community safety. Um, and so now what's important to note is that if we as a group are interested in, in improving health outcomes, it's not just healthcare providers that are responsible, it's this entire system of issues that we need to address to, um, to make uh, reasonable change happen. And it's supported by the data as well. And this support from the data has led to additional emphasis and growth and a focus on social determinants of health. And so you can see here, this is um, one of the infographics from the Center for Health Equity and Innovation that I work with under Dr. Gonzalvo. Um, but these are the areas that we within the, in Checky, which is the center that I just mentioned, um, are hoping to address within our healthcare activities. It's no longer just looking at health as what happens between the walls of a clinic or a traditional facility. It's starting to address all of these things. And you can see the different drivers of this in the table to the right, but you can see that all of these things are important to the health of, of the communities we serve. And they're especially important to ethnic minorities, um, especially African-American communities, as Dr. Williams very clearly mentioned. And I just wanna give you more data on how, on how large these issues loom for populations. Um, so if you can see this, this graph over here, um, what becomes very clear is this is a graph that's looking at the influence of parental income and the health of their children. And so I just want you to digest that for a second, that the income level of the parent actually has significant health consequences for the child. So we're actually passing down bad health based on the poverty of the, the, the father and the mother. And so we're actually passing down bad health across generations. And if you look at these charts in greater detail, first thing I'll, I'll highlight is that the darker green you get, that's the higher level of poverty that you have. And on the y-axis, what you see here is the percentage of children um, aged uh, seven, less than 17 years with less than good health. And as you can see, as the poverty level gets worse, basically the, the level of poor health for children goes up. And if you look in the, on the other side, this is even more concerning, that despite most people thinking poverty leads to underweight and, and malnutrition in a traditional fashion, it does lead to malnutrition, but in a non-traditional fashion. What, what actually happens here is the, the more um, income, uh, the, the, the higher poverty level that you're in, meaning that if you're more poor, you have more children who are more overweight or obese, which is not what people would expect on the surface. But as you look at the data, it's very, it's very obvious that poverty has health consequences, not just for the parents, but also for the children. And we're passing these things on through the generation. Uh, and, and what I mean by malnutrition is it's, it's not just malnutrition that causes um, some of these issues. There's actually lack of access to high quality foods. So malnutrition does not necessarily mean a caloric deficiency. It means a deficiency of high quality foods, which a lot of these low income families lack, where a lot of times they'll go with the cheaper option, um, which is usually made of processed foods. Um, and, and we could have a whole hour long discussion about the consequences of that. And that's actually one of the areas that we're working on and I hope to discuss in the Q&A. So another example of showing how income, race, and health all are interlinked. This shows you the percentage of, of persons with poor or fair health based on race and their poverty level. So once again, darker green means they're in a higher, uh, in a worse poverty level. Um, and basically the health of populations are more compromised. And what really stands out here is that um, black populations actually experience the worst health as a, as a result of poverty, where you can see with Hispanic populations, 19.2% uh, in this poverty bracket are in poor, poor or fair health, whereas for African Americans, it's 23.9% that are in poor or fair health. Now, just to highlight once again, that these are all national statistics. I wanna highlight again that these are issues that also pervade issues, the, the areas in our backyard. So this is all data from Indianapolis. So once again, here's the poverty rate by race. Uh, you can see that uh, Hispanic and, and black populations have the highest poverty rates in Indianapolis. And then the median household income by race 
Once again, Hispanic and black populations have the lowest median house, household income. Um, and once again, you can see that this would almost, from, from understanding the data and the literature that's proven this consistently, low income also leads to poor health. And it's pretty clear and obvious from these graphs, um, but if you have questions about that, please feel free to ask further. Now, I wanna, I, I wanna also show what we're doing in response to this in the US. So despite this growing awareness of the impact of these non-traditional determinants of health, these non-traditional things that actually impact health that go beyond the clinic, we still spend most of our money on traditional healthcare services. And so if you look at this graph here with the, the blue and the green bars, this basically shows you the spending as a percentage of GDP on total health service expenditures, as you can see in the blue. So the US spends 16.3% of our total GDP on, on health services and only 9.1% on social services. So all these things that I talked about that are responsible for this other 80% of your health outcomes, we basically spend disproportionately less than any of these, and then almost any of these other countries on, on, this, on this graph um, on those things. But we do spend a lot more on the 20%, uh, which is related to a variety of reasons, but it, it really highlights how we're not actually putting our money where our mouth is and where the impact could actually be, uh, and we're not addressing these issues. And if you look at this, this table, what you basically see here, once again, is that in almost every aspect of social service expenditure, we spend less than almost all of these other countries that you see in this, in this graph to the right, where we spend less on incapacity-related issues. So if you have disability benefits, um, we spend less on that than these other countries. Uh, and as much as you might hear us in these political circles talk about how we're pro-family, we might say that, but we have not put our money there. Um, and, and I don't want to deviate into a discussion of gender equity because that's a whole other topic that would take another hour, but it, it, it's, it's crazy to me that we live in a country that does not give um, paid parental leave. I can tell you that when I went, when I was in Kenya, this is a country that's, you know, has been lower, low, uh, low middle income. We get paid parental leave for mothers there. Um, they actually have rooms that are designed for them to, to breastfeed in. There's a whole range of services despite the lower income status of a country like Kenya. Uh, so I, I think that should all give us pause that, uh, that we as a country that's as developed and has as many resources as we do, we don't actually prioritize family as much as we say we do. Um, and I, I think it's important to um, acknowledge these, these hypocrisies um, whenever, wherever they're present. Uh, and you can see here housing, we also give less than these other countries. We do give more in these other benefits, um, but by and large, we fund social services a lot less than any of these other countries on this list. So I wanna go again to another polling question because I'm sure you're tired of hearing from me. Um, so I wanna give you a chance to make sure you're awake. All right, so I'm going to... Uh, All right, so I'm hoping you can see this question. So what, what are your thoughts on the current management of COVID-19 in the US? The first one is superb. You can read what that, um, uh, what that means. Uh, the second one is good. The third one is fair. Fourth one is poor. And the fifth one is horrible. I'll, I'll give it the polling a minute. All right, so I'm gonna share the results so you can see them here. Um, the majority of you responded that we either did a poor or horrible job. Um, yeah, I, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. There's a couple of people who said that we did a fair job. So I wanna do another polling for you guys. I'm gonna do one more question and then we'll move on to the next topic. All right, so here's another question. Um, 
how do you think we should address racial disparities in the U.S. healthcare system? So the first option is keep the U.S. healthcare the same, but increase access to health insurance for underserved populations. Scrap the current system and redesign the system to be more responsive to the unique needs of underserved populations. Shift to a government-based healthcare system, which tries to offer the same healthcare to everyone, uh, similar to the Europe and Canada, um, and decrease decrease costs by mandating lower re reimbursements for providers, medications, and services. And then the last option is is we don't need any changes. It is fine as it is. Great, thank you. So I'm hoping you guys can all see the results. Um, most people suggested to shift to a more government-based healthcare system, which tries to offer the same healthcare to everyone. And you can see another 32% per, said to scrap the current system and redesign the system. Um, thank you once again for your results. I'm hoping you guys can all see them as well. Great. So uh, now, now that I, I, we've done the two polls, I think it's pretty clear that a lot of us are fairly aligned in some of these challenges. And, and the reality is, is that the suggestion that our response as a country has been poor is supported by the data, and especially supported when you look at this from an equity lens. Uh, so similar to what um, Dr. Williams mentioned, I, I wanted to go even a little bit deeper in this, is this is comparing the um, case incidence rates of coronavirus uh, across ethnic uh, different ethnic groups. And this is all comparing to Caucasian populations. So I want to first highlight for African American population, there's a 2.6 times higher probability to have coronavirus, to have, be a coronavirus case if you're black. Um, hospitalization is 4.7 times higher, and death is 2.1 times higher. Uh, and I just want to pound home another point that I think Dr. Williams mentioned so, so perfectly. Coronavirus is shedding a light on many of these inequities that we have known exist in our society um, and just haven't addressed. Uh, and, and really the issues that you see here are basically a result of many of these under underappreciated, under addressed issues that we as a community, as a society have known exist in America. Uh, and so coronavirus has basically highlighted all of these. And you can see for other ethnicity groups, similar issues and disparities exist. Um, and these are all concerning. And part of the challenge is that the drivers of this are a lot of the economic reality. So if you're a frontline worker and live paycheck to paycheck, you don't really have the choice of social distancing. A lot of times you have to be the clerk who can't social distance, who has to be in close proximity to peop people who might be infected. Whereas people like me might not have to do that. And, and so a lot of these risks of coronavirus are tied to a lot of these social determinants of health that we've already discussed. And just to provide further credence to some of the notions that we discussed about how America is doing relative to other countries, um, clearly, as you can see in the graph to the left, um, the European Union has pretty much completed their first phase. They're now preparing for the second wave. Um, we have not really completed our first wave. Uh, and so there's a lot of concern that this pandemic is going to get a lot worse in America before it gets better. Uh, and, and the other thing that's clear is if you look at the metrics by number of cases, we're number one. By number of deaths, we're also number one. So this is, once again, very concerning. Uh, and our performance is pretty depressing and pretty disappointing when you think about the resources and the things that we could do if we decided as a country that these things were important to address. But, but clearly, we haven't. And I, I wanted to now shift gears a little bit. Uh, and and I, I think this is an important topic as we enter an election cycle. Uh, and it highlights a lot of the things that Dr. Williams was mentioning, where there's a lot of these issues that are known, but when he was talking to his colleague, there was a lot of notions that that colleague was mentioning that simply don't comport with the reality of what the evidence is showing, what the facts show us. And a lot of that relates to this notion of cognitive dissonance. And so cognitive dissonance is basically the mental conflict that occurs when beliefs or assumptions are contradicted by new information. Um, and so people try to address these things. And what we're seeing a lot of is that people, instead of dealing with the conflict and the unpleasant truth, they're relying on comforting lies um, to, to make themselves comfortable. And I just want to take one example of, of what, how we're seeing this in our current political cycle. 
Um, and so there's different ways that people deal with these internal contradictions. There's people might try to modify their beliefs. They might try to trivialize the, the new truth that they've heard. They might add things or deny things. And I just want to give you an example of what we're seeing in terms of police brutality, especially in discussions that I'm sure many of us might have had with colleagues or other people. And so when you look at America as a whole, and now let's just focus on the majority population, which is Caucasians, most of them hold on to this notion that police are good and, and would not do things like the things that we're seeing on video right now. And so 68% of Caucasians um, believe that police are generally good. Now, when you're faced with this reality that police continue to disproportionately use force to kill black men, which is evident from any statistic you look at, from any video you watch uh, that highlights the, the murder of, of black men, um, you can't really deny it. And so people don't like that discomfort. And so there's a lot of strategies that people are using to try to deal with that comfort. Some people might actually deal with the uncomfortable truth, but a lot of times what you're seeing is that they try to modify the issue so that it's not an issue. So even if you watch certain news outlets, there's a lot of talk about how George Floyd had drugs in his system, and that's why he died of asphyxiation. These are things that are clearly irrelevant to the discussion, but people are modifying it so that they can be more comfortable with their old view. People try to trivialize it. So notions like all lives matter, where you're diminishing the real issue of disproportionate police brutality against black people by saying, oh no, well, all lives matter. Why are you any different? Um, that's another strategy that we're seeing. And even to the extent of denial from the highest um, seats of our government, where people are denying that systemic racism actually even exists. And so a lot of times people are very comfortable with siding with these notions because it makes them comfortable with a lot of the beliefs that they previously held. And these strategies are remarkably effective. Uh, and that's the unfortunate truth. And the reason for discussing them is I think it's important to understand what people are doing when they're saying certain things um, so that we can actually start to address them. And so it, it's so effective that it's actually become a campaign strategy. And, and, it, and this is well documented. I, Steve Bannon, who used to be Trump's campaign strategist, said he actually loves when there's racial strife in America because it all drives a lot of people towards uh, a Trump presidency. And so basically his quote was, the race identi identity politics of the left wants to say it's all racist. And he says, give me more of that. Tear down more statues. Say the revolution is co coming. He can't get enough of it. And this is basically the campaign strategy that, that is currently going on in the U.S. right now with a lot of the messages that you're seeing. And it's, to me, truly despicable that we don't actually treat all Americans the same. Like, we codify Americans based on their ethnicity and, and, and actually don't feel like the government is actually supporting all Americans equally or even trying to or even falsely suggesting that. Um, it's now open and clear to see that we don't do that. Um, and it's actually become a very powerful strategy. And so I just want to finish with a couple of key messages before we discuss some of the um, questions that you might have is I, I want to, uh, this is basically me telling people to do what I'm not good at. Don't get distracted by these attempts to deter you from the real issues. The real issues to me are these social determinants of health. Whereas all these issues where now we focus on what Trump has said or what the current government is saying, they're just distraction techniques to pacify people who hold on to these notions. Don't get distracted by that, focus on the real issues. And that also goes to this notion of don't just treat the symptoms, address the underlying causes. And, and Dr. Williams discussed that very well, so I don't wanna repeat that. Um, but these underlying causes are the things that if we address them, a lot of these broader symptoms that we see will go away. Uh, and, and lastly, you know, I think it's important to have these discussions of the psychological aspects of what we're seeing in front of us, because it takes a mental toll on all of us. And I'll speak for myself, it definitely takes a mental toll of me. Um, and, and I think it's important for us to understand how we think, how other people think, so we can, we can become more effective advocates uh, and find ways to make more people more willing to accept the truth. Um, and with that, I'll stop there and, and look forward to answering some of your questions. And thank you for your participation. Thank you, Dr. Pistacchia. A virtual round of applause since we're in COVID times. Um, I have a few questions that I wanted to, and please keep uh, adding your questions into the chat. We have our co-hosts uh, fielding those. The first question is for Dr. Williams. Would addressing the social determinants of health help address both gun violence deaths and COVID-19 deaths in black communities? And if so, where do we start? 
Uh, absolutely addressing the social determinants of health would, would address those. And that just shows that, that the person asked that question recognizing that, that these things are interlinked, that um, uh, they, they intersect the gun violence, COVID-19 deaths, all social determinants of health are, are what are contributing to these inequities that we see within healthcare, but it's also playing out in education and employment and income inequality. So if we go back to the root cause, right? We are so, especially in medicine, we're taught to treat the disease, treat the injuries, but we wanna go back to the root cause that's leading to this. If we can address that upstream, have an intervention there, then it will pay huge dividends. And as Dr. Pisaki was saying, 80% uh, of proving health has nothing to do with what happens within the hospital, has nothing to do with the clinical care we provide. So absolutely addressing the social determinants of health would reduce gun violence, uh, it would reduce uh, COVID deaths, and it would have an impact across communities in so many other ways. Uh, and I think the part, second part of that question was, was how do we do that? Well, part of that is us taking our expertise and experience within healthcare and getting outside of the confinements of our institutions and one, meeting with the communities that we profess that we are trying to help and just ask, okay, what is it that you need? Don't give them the answer, ask to partner with them. In addition to that, partner with other folks that are doing similar work, but from a different angle, nonprofits, um, elected officials, uh, academia, business, there is so much to do. Um, we just focus on like one little part of it and, and add that to the solution, then we can make tremendous change. Thank you. And I think you may have answered the second question, but I'll still ask it because it was for both of you. Um, you know, when thinking about the role of medical providers in addressing these root causes or the role of academia, maybe we'll start with Dr. Pistacchio. What, what do you think the role of academia should be in addressing these root causes um, and, and specifically these, these social determinants that you were talking about? Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll echo a lot of Dr. Williams' comments. You know, the role of act academia should be defined by the people we're trying to serve, not just the students, but the communities we're trying to serve. I, it's very clear, especially in the era of coronavirus, that these university campuses are an integral part of this community. Uh, and, and as we discuss different strategies for mitigating coronavirus, it's not as simple as saying, OK, well, let's open the schools because students are at lower risk. These are the centers of entire communities. These are large campuses and, and spread amongst the, the school going students will eventually lead to spread amongst other people in the community. So instead of me defining what the role of academia is, my strategy has always been to listen to the people I'm trying to serve and then work with them to come up with solutions. And, and this is one of the things that's really been the keys to our success in our work in Kenya is that we work directly with the community. We are not even an NGO, we are partners of the Ministry of Health and all of our best ideas, which you know I get credit for because my name is on the publication, have actually come from the communities we actually serve because they told us what we needed, what they needed, and we actually listened and did what they told us to do, and then I get all the credit, which once again is silly, but that's the n nature of academia. I'd rather get credit for something that actually does something positive for the community than you know continuing to just do what I think is right, which a lot of times isn't right. Uh, and the same approach applies to the U.S., where we don't do enough listening to the communities. We as, as a healthcare provider, I'll speak for myself, it's much more comfortable for me to sit in the office and wait for patients to come for me, come to me. I can set up a schedule of them and they come as opposed to me going out to the community and, and meeting community groups and providing services out there, which is one of the strategies that we did in Kenya, which led to dramatic improvements in all aspects of care from so staying in care to health outcomes, to performance, to all of these things improved because we actually built a healthcare model that was designed around the populations we're trying to serve. That, that to me is the key. And, and so the answer to your question is, let the community tell you and then work around there. Absolutely. Um, Can I add to that really quick, Dr. Rodriguez? Yes, please. Because something Dr. Pistacchi did that was, I thought was so effective uh, about this was that he, and what academia can do was bring the science to it, that, that rigorous scientific method. Because he just laid out the facts. Here's what the science shows, X, Y, Z. So, uh, we, expect, we accept there are some science deniers that are out there, right? But he laid it out there. So it's hard to, hard to argue that based on just your pure emotion. If you can table that and just look at the numbers and what he's showing you, you say, yeah, it's hard to argue with that. That's academia, that's science. Uh, let's put that to work in, 
in combination with what the community needs. And is there an opportunity, just a follow-up question, um, I think it's, it's kind of awesome to have both of you on, on this panel because is there an opportunity for healthcare providers and academia to work together for this very specific cause, uh, this very specific purpose of addressing these root causes? To either one of you. Uh, well, well I'll, I consider myself an academic as well as a, a clinician. So I, I don't separate those two uh, identities within myself. Uh, but so the short answer is, yes, that is possible. I think that is incumbent. I think there's no other way around it that uh, uh, academ academia and medicine must combine, uh, but also recognize that I'm unique working in an academic center my entire career, but most medicine across the country is not delivered from academic centers. Uh, so if we look at that as the sole um, repository of this sort of expertise and this possibility for progress, they were missing a large swath of of, of the country that can contribute to this. Most healthcare is delivered from, away from an academic center, so uh, partnering with those communities that are providing the care with academic ac academicians that could give that sort of expertise will lead to uh, uh, a huge advantage as far as moving the needle on, on progress. And I just want to quickly repeat the, an answer that Dr. Williams gave during his presentation on that question. It, to me, the, the question is not whether academic providers and traditional healthcare providers need to integrate. It's actually this broader milieu of interdisciplinary um, aspects of care that that needs to be integrated. Uh, and if you ever get time, there's a beautiful report that the Institute of Medicine did on integrating social determinants of health into healthcare. That, to me, is where the real focus should be. And to me, you know, a lot of academic medical providers are also healthcare providers. Um, that that's not where the issue really is. It's integrating these other pieces to make a more uh, convenient and comfortable experience for the patients you're trying to serve, uh, rather than forcing them into the dynamics that we want as providers. And um, last thing, integrate that into education, right, Dr. Pastakia? You know, nursing school, yes. medical school, pharmacy school, you have to get it into the education before they get out into practice. Absolutely. Um, and I see we have many students here with us tonight, so that's excellent. Um, one question, I think, from a student. I'm curious if either of you think it is important to have people of color, blacks, Latinos, et cetera, participate in research trials, um, clinical trials, I think, for example, the ones currently going on to establish a COVID vaccine, particularly with the history of scientific and medical research abuse in these communities. Great question. Maybe we'll start with Dr. Williams. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm going to be <laughs> Okay, so, so there's lots to unpack with that. And, and first, we need to just dispel this notion of uh, race uh, and what that means for humanity and for medical research. Uh, race is a, a biological construct. We need to hammer that home in education and to continue to, to base scientific research and publications as say they use race as a risk factor um i think is a disservice to uh the the, the healthcare community or our trainees but also the patients we serve because we are dividing people up before you even touch them we're looking at them and saying you have risk factors based upon your race uh, so when it comes to including multi-ethnic uh individuals within our our clinical trials we have to acknowledge the history of exploitation of minorities for, for medical research throughout the history of this country, particularly for black Americans. And this goes back hundreds of years and it, and it still continues today in some ways. Uh, if you look around major academic medical centers, they're usually, usually co-located near and a, a, a depressed community that's economically depressed, but also racially segregated and you'll find a large number of publications come out of studying these populations, right? It's not about studying these people. It's what, what can we do to uplift communities? So yes, it is important to include everyone, but uh, let's recognize our shared humanity and not look at them as just research subjects, right? Based on their race and ethnicity. And I just want to add a small part to that. You know, I think in looking at the question that you've asked, the, the big thing for me is the intent uh, and acknowledging the intent of these past efforts to include certain ethnic minorities into study. 
those intents were to take advantage of a vulnerable population. That's why there's a lot of rules now in research. Um, right. And so I, I would really, to answer your question, not just for this situation, but for other situation is, what is the intent of trying to include um, different uh, gender, uh, different ethnicities? And even going to gender, I think gender is also important. Um, and, and as a pharmacist, there's, there's also clear cut data that different, um, different uh, ethnicities respond to medications differently as well. And so you know, that, that's an important thing to uncover if possible uh, in some of these trials as well. Uh, and so to me, what's the real question here is what is the intent of trying to include uh, some of these individuals? Um, and not just for the sake of the research, but you know, who are you trying to benefit afterwards? If you're doing research in Africans for HIV drugs so that you can benefit rich people in other countries, clearly that is ethically wrong. Whereas if you're doing these vaccine trials um, with certain ethnic minorities, because you, you see clearly from the data that certain, um, certain ethnicities are having higher risk and you want to make sure that the vaccine works in these populations, then that's a different question. And then there's more questions to unpack and more things to unravel from that. Uh, but I think the intent and the, the purpose for doing it is important to consider. Absolutely. Um, shifting gears a little bit, we have a question about, um, and this is for Dr. Pistacchia, about uh, interventions on access to nutritious foods. And are there studies that demonstrate that once people have access to nutritious foods, their preferences uh, change and if those behaviors are sustained? Yeah, I, I think it's a great question and the, the, the comprehensive answer would take about 20 minutes to answer, but there's, <laughs> so much variability in the research that it's hard to give you a, a clear-cut answer. So I'm not going to directly answer your question, but what I would say is the thing that I find lacking in a lot of the nutrition interventions is that they tackle one small part of it. So for example, there's clear data that there's food deserts, especially in underserved inner city communities. And so the solution a lot of times is, okay, so just introduce fresh fruits at the grocery store. But that doesn't go far enough because there's income issues, there's economic issues, there's um, time issues where it often takes a little bit more time to prepare um, fresh fruits and vegetables and they might cost a little bit more. So these piecemeal approaches don't work in isolation. What, my, what we're trying to do actively in Indianapolis is come up with more comprehensive solutions where we find ways to address all the barriers in, one more, in, in a more comprehensive package. Uh, and, and that's how, and when we're doing that, we're seeing early success with that. Um, and, and we're actually doing this in the schools as well, where, uh, you know, I, I want to hark another point of education being important. If you look at the school meals that um, kids who get government meals get, it's, it's laughable. It's, it's embarrassing that we would ever feed our kids that and do it prefer, like we're doing that by rule. Um, and so we're actually trying to intervene and work with some of the foundations in Indianapolis hmm. to improve school lunches um, by actually introducing fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and there's some, I mean, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. There's, I, I can't remember the exact dollar amount, but it's less than $2 per meal that the government is allowed to spend on a meal per kid. So you, you think about some of the trade-offs you have to make when it's less than, a, less than $2. I think it's about $1.75 that each meal has to cost. And if you're trying to introduce fresh fruits and vegetables, all of a sudden that becomes a much harder thing to do because the government says, no, you can't do that. That's too expensive. Hmm. Um, sorry, I'm fielding some of these questions. Um, for Dr. Williams, uh, thank you for the presentation. Speaking to what we can do more than talking at the university level, your thoughts on having black studies as humanities requirements? Um, similar to math or English requirements, uh, so students of different backgrounds can understand black experience in America. So, the short answer to that is yes. I think get, doing that at the university level is, is too late. This is something we should be learning in, mm -hmm. in grade school, right? Uh, I mean, for me, as a black American, I, I didn't really even learn the full scope of what um, enslavement meant to my ancestors until I was an adult. And we can tell the full story, right? We can tell the entire story with, um, with truth and integrity without blaming or trying to uh, shame people or lead to guilt. That is not the intent. The intent is just recognizing the, the richness of our history, warts and all, putting it all together and how do we how do we move forward so we shouldn't be afraid to talk about 
all the, uh, the, the truly human and physical and mental atrocities that have been committed against uh, black Americans and Native Americans and many of the immigrants that have, that have come to this nation. And uh, we, those of us in healthcare, you know, we, we're seeing the, the end result of a lot of that because it plays out and leads to healthcare inequities, and we see them in our clinics, in, in our pharmacies. Uh, but if you peel back all these different layers, it just comes back like, let's, let's tell the full story. It's okay. We can teach our children that. We can move forward and have constructive dialogue. We may not agree. But to pretend, pretend this doesn't happen and it doesn't have any impact is not uh, good for the health of the country as a whole. And I'll give a one-line response because I agree with everything you said. Telling the truth can't be viewed as anti-American if it's a truth you don't like as an American. I think that's, that's one of the things that's com concerning to me is that if it's a truth that Americans don't like, then it's anti-American. But I think the truth is the truth and it makes us stronger as a country when we can actually discuss the truth openly and address a lot of the, the misdeeds we've done and learn from them and correct them. Um, I, that, that's one of my big frustrations of, um, of the education system. Very well put. Um, when, well, we have a couple more questions. I know we're, we're running a little late, but I think this is a great conversation. I'd like to keep going. Um, is it true that much of the discrepancy in life expectancy between neighborhoods is due to infant mortality? Assuming that this is true and has not changed, should we expect the discrepancies to increase due to COVID? We can start with Dr. Vista. Uh, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I mean, I'd say, I think infant mortality is just one example of the difference in life expectancy, not, not the only uh, example. And I think, I don't have not the root cause, but I would say that infant mortality is, uh, shows that the social determinants of health that Dr. Pistacchia uh, mentioned are in, impacting uh, young children and infants. It doesn't just play out in, in adults. So if we can address all those social determinants that Dr. Pistacchia uh, so eloquently laid out, then we will have lower infant, infant mortality, we will have healthier children, we will have healthier uh, adults, mm -hmm. and this transgenerational uh, impact of health inequality, we, we can minimize that. And, and in a utopic world, we could eradicate that, right? If we have the knowledge, tell the full story, recognize our shared humanity, and put the effort and resources to uh, addressing it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any current initiatives in place to better bridge the gap in getting research to our healthcare policies and procedures faster? I feel like there's so much literature out there, but nothing is being done to actively impact the communities. How do we translate that research to, to actionable um, solutions? I'll, I'll, I'll take the first track of that one. I, I think the key is to not get so distracted by the broader issues that you dismiss the things that we can do at a local level, the positive things we can do at a local level. And this is something that I struggle with, where you know, right now, if we look at policy for healthcare as a whole, Healthcare, healthcare um, programs that are designed to serve the underserved are under attack. And so a lot of us are in this reactive phase where there's efforts to roll back some of the tenants of Obamacare and, and the Affordable Care Act. There's efforts to make pre-existing conditions not covered anymore. And so a lot of, a lot of people like me are, are getting distracted by these broader efforts um, to basically dismantle things that have shown some progress in reducing the number of low-income populations that are uninsured or don't have access to health care. Uh, but to me, I think the real key is to not, not get so blinded by these bigger issues that are, are looming um, that prevent you from working at the local level to have even small wins. Uh, and, and I think that's where I'm trying to focus a lot more of my energy so that there's an avenue where a lot of the things that we talk about can actually see and directly impact people and patients rather than getting so burnt out and burned down by a lot of these broader discussions that to me are frankly depressing. And I'll add to that when you talk about how academics can impact policy, well, we are very good at talking to ourselves, right? Even, even tonight we have, you know, all of us have a doctoral level of degrees. We're having this discussion and much of our audience is, is either there or on that, on that track, but to take what we know and give it to the policymakers and give it to the community, that's what we, we probably could do better as academicians. Uh, you know, 
more of the somehow getting to the getting the policy memos written that, that influence decision makers that are making those broad uh, decisions that will affect entire communities or op-eds or something that's not a you know a peer-reviewed journal that requires a month to get <laughs> approved and, and published but then taking that information and getting it out to the public where they can actually uh, use that to have some action and intervene and improve uh, the communities as a whole so and I want to add one more thing relating to the presentation. You know, much like I talked about cognitive dissonance and people want uh, comfortable lives. I can say for me, it's much more comfortable to talk to people in this call because if you look at the poll responses, it's pretty clear that we're all talking in the same bubble and we largely share the same beliefs. But that might make me feel good, but I don't know that it does a lot of good. Where if we're not reaching people who might disagree with that or have a different set of views, we're just basically making ourselves comfortable. And this is something that I'm frustrated with with myself, where I'm talking to groups like this and feeling very good, like, oh, we had a great discussion. But I don't know that I really changed anybody's opinion on much of anything, because by and large, most of you agreed with what I was going to say anyway. And so um, this is one of the things that I really struggled with at USAID when I worked there for a year to try to uh, influence policy was it's hard to get people who come from a different whole mind construct from you and to convince them of things that are demonstrably true. Um, it, it's a huge undertaking and I, I think it's something we should challenge all of ourselves to do, myself included. Totally well, agree. We this, this, uh, go ahead. Dr. Rodriguez, I, we've gotten all this way Dr. Pistaki and it's the first time I have to disagree with something you said. <laughs> I, think, I think you're having great impacts here. I think there's some students on this call that may not have thought about this. I think there's someone in this, uh, in this uh, in the audience, like, I'm sure there's one person out there that we've impacted that's going to probably say something to somebody else or not be afraid to speak truth to power. So, uh, yeah, and, I, I, and I'll I, add to that. I think really important to mention these, as you know, these are open to the public. So we do have community members that are not Purdue affiliated on this call. And actually, we have a comment from one of them uh, mentioning she's a member of a local group that works in the community to serve Black youth, provide leadership training and scholarships. I'm amazed by how connected they are to other community groups and to local politicians. I first connected with them during a research project on health disparities and stayed involved because of the friendships I made and our shared priorities. So I think this is great that we have community members um, tuning in. And I want to end with just one question, but it's multi-part, so, so bear with me. Um, I'm, I'm merging three questions in one. Um, one of the questions was, other than voting, what is the number one thing I can do to make healthcare more equitable? How can I actually make a difference? Um, the second question is, um, what should people in the audience who self-identify as allies know to help them be better accomplices to communities of color? And um, and then the third, well, so what we'll let me just uh, let me just start with those two, <laughs> and then I might have one last one after. So what can people do other than voting? What's, what's, where do we start? I, I can give a first crack. And, and uh, to, to the last comment, uh, I, I hope you're right. Uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm, I hope that um, there are people in this uh, group that will change. And, and my, my point is that I want us to take on the challenge of reaching out to other groups that might never hear this message. Um, it's hard to blame somebody who believes something when they've never heard anything contrary to that. Uh, and and that's, that's kind of the challenge that I'm placing on myself to, to be better at. Um, and that, you know, that's why I started teaching at a high school. That's why I tried to teach at these things, and it was a challenge. I, I struggled mightily at it, and, and it's uh, more of a reflection on that than any diminishing of what I think the people on this group can accomplish, because I, I, I hope and, and, and believe that you guys can do amazing things in the future. Uh, and to answer this question, you know, I think the thing that's important is to listen more. Um, and this is something that I've tried to do more. Um, I'm still not as good, as it, good at it as I'd hope to be, but we need to listen more. I think we are so, so locked into our own belief set and, and assuming that we are right all the time that we stop listening. So I think the first thing is to listen. Uh, and if people give you something that is doable and feasible, why not act on it and work with them to act on it? Um, and then once you act on it and demonstrate some success, I think the next part is to advocate and to spread the message and disseminate. So this is also an answer to that previous question of what's the role of academia is we have to disseminate some of these learnings. And that's, to me, also the role of every individual is that if you do something, it works, 
and, and you're part of that solution, it's important for you to advocate for it and disseminate it to others so that we can replicate that success for more and more people. Mm -hmm. You're defining community-based participatory research for the many of my students I see on the call. So thank you. I didn't tell him to say that. Um, <laughs> Dr. Williams, do you have anything to add to that? I, I'm sorry. It's important to vote, but it's also important to get other people to vote. Y yeah. You can do your part, but just get other people to register, get your family, friends, whomever, participate in voter registration drives that are happening across the country right now. Help others that do not have the ability or may have some more barriers to vote to, to, to vote. That is so important. Vote, vote, vote. Um, and I, I want to you know, kind of take a twist on what Dr. Pataki has said, and we talked about listening. That we talk about working with communities of color or trying to advocate or have impact communities of cover, color. Diversity does not equal understanding. Diversity is not enough. It does not equal understanding. So to get to that level of understanding, you need to listen to understand. You need to have proximity to the communities that, that you want to help. So that requires many people to get out of your comfort zone. You need to be willing to step out of your comfort zone, get proximate to these communities that you want to help, and then be willing to listen to understand. So shed our degrees, shed our, our, our accolades and, our, and all of our awards, and say, you know what? I may have all this, but for sure, you know a lot more about your situation than I do. What can you teach me and then how can I help? Oh. And, and I saw this quote just yesterday, diversity does not equal inclusion and neither of those things equal anti-racism, so we got to stop using them interchangeably. Um, anyway, I don't see any more questions coming in the chat, so any last words from our panelists? Dr. Stocky, it was great meeting you, man. I had fun. <laughs> I really appreciate the questions, guys. I think this is a great discussion. And just to, you know, I think it's also important to be self-reflective, just to comment one step further on what Dr. Williams mentioned with his last response. Um, in my own journey of going to Kenya, you know, I had a master's, I had a, a farm, pharmacy degree. I thought I had all the answers when I got there. And in my first six months, I consistently failed and kept on blaming others for my, for, for my failures. And then at some point, I finally just stopped and listened to what the people I was working with, the people I was working for were saying. And I said, this is why I failed. Like, I just simply didn't listen because I thought I had all the answers. And everything I saw, I just saw poverty. And I didn't see the beauty of the Kenyan culture that I, I was fortunate enough to work in. And once I started to see that, once I started to appreciate just the strength of that community, how many assets they have that most people like me don't see. Once I opened my eyes and actually saw that and listened to them, that's when we finally started having success was because we did what they were telling us and we leveraged their unique strengths instead of always looking down upon them. Um, and so I think even as we try to serve underserved communities, the thing here is not to look down on people. And, and we do this as a culture in the US and it's very frustrating to me. We consistently look down on people who do um, Less, we, we consistently look up to people who do less with more and look down on people who do more with less. And I think one of the first steps in actually addressing a lot of these inequities is to not continue looking down on people who do more with less. I think that's actually one of the strengths that we need to learn as resources get limited and as more issues come up, they're gonna be the ones who have the answers to the problems that we haven't yet addressed because we have so much abundance of resources that we don't know what to do with it and we don't even think about it. Um, and so instead of looking down on people, I think there's a lot of strength that's there that we can learn from and actually adapt to and incorporate in all of our lives. Very well said. Well, I want to thank you both so much for participating. What an honor to have you here with our Purdue community this evening. Um, and thank you all for tuning in. Please check out the Black Cultural Center's website as well as the Department of Public Health's website. Uh, we have upcoming events. Um, on many of these topics and, and more. So thank you all for tuning in. Bye, Dr. Williams. Bye, Dr. Pistacchia. Thank you so much. I guess. Well, thank you very much, Purdue and Black Cultural Center. And anybody, please reach out anytime. You have my contact information. Stay safe, everyone. Stay safe. <laughs>